and tired of, of the broad effects of, of COVID, uh, which of course have touched some people, uh, especially painfully and directly uh, with lives lost, loved ones hospitalized, uh, and countless other suffering. So I, I thought I would just start by actually asking a question and maybe people can put their thoughts in the Zoom chat. Why has the United States suffered so grievously and disproportionately compared to our size during the COVID pandemic? What accounts for the United States leading the world in infections, in deaths, more than half a million deaths now. What accounts for it, if you had to put it in a few words in the chat? Trump, Gavin Newsom, governors, Republican governors, Democratic governors, Anthony Fauci, Obama, racism, capitalism, People's political opposition to safety plans, lack of leadership, and now I'm reading the, the chat, lack of leadership and capacity to account for cases, deaths, individualism, rejection of expertise, politics over science, limited advanced planning, the freedom to not care very much. We invest more in death than life-sustaining systems, for example, the war machine. I think all of the causes that people listed are surely part of the answer as to why the United States, people in the United States have suffered so grievously in the COVID pandemic. I, I do want to point to the importance of war and endless wars in explaining the suffering that has been experienced in, in the United States uh, since the beginning of the, the COVID pandemic. Endless wars, I want to argue, are a major reason for this suffering. Let's just look at the money that's been invested in endless wars alone. It's the National Priorities Project. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. These are the total costs of the US wars since 2001. The original source is the Costs of War Project. And this does not include interest that the United States will be paying and some other costs that the United States will be paying. And when I say the United States, really I mean US taxpayers will be paying into the future. This is the money ticking away. Sometimes I think I couldn't say anything more powerful than just watching the screen. The total costs now are estimated at $6.4 trillion, including interest payments and future veterans payments. $6.4 trillion as of actually last October. So the total now surely is creeping toward $7 trillion. That's how I put it in my new book United States of War, asking some questions about the money that's been poured into these endless wars. How many have died or suffered unnecessarily because the US government didn't invest in adequate pandemic preparedness? The cost of assembling an adequate supply of masks and other personal protective equipment, an adequate ventilator supply, robust testing and vaccine production capacity, among other public health tools, would have been a tiny fraction of the $6.4 trillion spent or obligated on the post 9-11 wars. Responsibility for the, post, for the COVID disaster doesn't just lie in one or two or three of the last presidential administrations. Responsibility lies in large measure in the long history of US wars and what's become a system of endless war. COVID has further demonstrated the urgency of changing that system. Let me just say a few words about how I ended up 
focusing my work on war, caring so much about war and, and its effects. I mean, in some ways it goes back to my childhood and my family background and going to a Quaker school, but I actually went to grad school focused on, uh, on gentrification and then my career took a, a big turn. Uh, but I think it actually is helpful to, to go back to, to my childhood because I grew up in the United States like many people really indoctrinated in an important sense into war. This is me playing a, a war game at someone's birthday party, running on top of a, a fort of some kind, a military base. I, of course, grew up playing cowboy, playing a different kind of football cowboy. And of course, like new generations now, I was a lover of Star Wars the Star Wars franchise, which of course taught me to connect with and feel like I was part of the Rebel Alliance rather than of course, as a US citizen uh, being part of the empire, which years later I would come to see was is a more accurate depiction of the place of the United States in the world and the power of the United States in the world. I came to a different understanding of the United States thanks to Diego Garcia, who sometimes is confused with Diego Rivera, the Mexican artist married to Frida Kahlo, different. Diego Garcia is a very isolated island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Actually, can I, can I ask again, just to, to um, can folks put in the chat, I'm curious, who has heard of Diego Garcia prior to, to now? If I can even. The fact is that very few people in the United States around the world know about Diego Garcia. Some know, as I did from the first Gulf War, that the United States has a very large military base on Diego Garcia, this island halfway between Indonesia and Africa, thousand miles from the nearest landmass, India. This is what Diego Garcia looks like very large US Air Force and Navy base, so close-ups of the runway, the Navy base. It's a base that's played key roles in all the US wars in the greater Middle East, including the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's been used to threaten Iran and increasingly to threaten China. There's been talk of closing the, finally, the US prison at Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay Diego Garcia was actually considered as a, a site for that prison before Guantanamo Bay was selected. It's actually much easier to get to Guantanamo Bay. I, I was able to do research there on a couple of occasions. No one can go to Diego Garcia unless you are in the US military or the British military. Britain is occupying the island, claims the island, although the UN disagrees. While some know about the military base on Diego Garcia, even fewer know about how that military base came to be. Even fewer know about the indigenous Chagosian people who once lived on Diego Garcia and the surrounding Chagos Islands. They'd been living there since the time of the American Revolution, in fact. The descendants of enslaved Africans and indentured Indians. Actually, they share, interestingly, they share, and this has given them some hope, about one day returning their homeland, they share ancestry with our current vice president, Kamala Harris, uh, mixed Indian and African ancestry. These are some images from the Chagosians' lives in the 1950s and 1960s. While their ancestors were enslaved and indentured over time, this diverse group of people formed a new society in the islands uh, that, and a, free society. Uh, it was a plantation society, but one where, as one Chagosian who I'll introduce you to in a moment, Rita Banku put it, they enjoyed the sweet life. They had guaranteed housing, guaranteed employment, full with work benefits, vacations, burial benefits, among other security in their lives. These are Chagosian children at school in the 1950s 
And the Chikosians and their ancestors had been living there, as I said, since the late 18th century. They lived there until the US and British governments conspired, and I use that word intentionally, they conspired, they knew what they were doing was a crime and US and British government documents show this, conspired to forcibly remove the Chagossians 1200 miles away to the Western Indian Ocean Islands of Mauritius and the Seychelles. These expulsions, the forced deportation of the Chagossians took place between 1968 and 1973. When the first journalist in the US or Western press broke the story of this expulsion, he did so in 1975, two years after the last Chagossian had been forced from their home. He found them living in abject poverty in Mauritius. These are some images from some of the research that I was able to do with the Chagosians uh, in 2003, 2004. This is what their lives look like today. Most still live in Mauritius and the Seychelles. Some live in, in Britain as a result of uh, one of the victories of their struggle to return home and get some proper compensation. A drawing by a Chagosian girl. Meanwhile, this is what Diego Garcia looks like aside from the weaponry we saw. Looks like a small or not so small US American town plopped down in the middle of the Indian Ocean, complete with a Martin Luther King Day beach bash. Meanwhile, US military personnel refer to the base as the footprint of freedom with no sense of the irony that that entails for the Chagossians, who again have been living in exile for more than 50 years. They have again been struggling to, to return to their homeland and gain some compensation. And I got involved because I got a very lucky phone call from one of their lawyers asking me to conduct some research, both ethnographic and quantitative research actually, to help document the effects of the expulsion on their lives and analyze the question of whether they constitute the indigenous people of the Chagos Archipelago. I found that they do, according to anthropological and legal understandings of the indigenous people term and concept. Let me just briefly read to you from the words of Rita Banku. She, like other Chagosians, was forced from her home and prevented from ever returning. And I think in you know, discussions of war, it's easy to, to lose sight of the, the people involved. So I, I wanna uh, give you a sense of, of what her life has, has looked like since she was exiled from her home. I asked Rita what it felt like when she heard she would never again re return home. She said it felt like she'd been sliced open and all the blood spilled from her body. She said that for an hour, she couldn't open her mouth to tell her family. Her heart was too swollen with emotion. Fina, finally, Rita told her family what the man at the steamship company had told her. Your island has been sold. You'll never go there again. Rita, her husband, Julien, and their five children found themselves exiled separated from their home, their land, their animals, their possessions, their jobs, their community, and the graves of their ancestors. The Bankus had been, as Chagossians say, deraciné, deracinated, uprooted, torn from their natal land. Within a year of getting this news, Rita spent several weeks in a psychiatric hospital where she told me she received shocks, electroshock therapy, Rita's husband, upon hearing the news that they would be exiled, suffered a stroke and increasing paralysis. Five years after suffering his stroke, Julien Bancou died. Rita said the cause of death was sagrin, profound sorrow, and many other Chagossians report deaths of profound sorrow or heartbreak, as do other displaced people, as I'm sure many of you know. 
After Julien's death, the Bancou's son, Alex, lost his job as a dark dock worker. He died at 38, addicted to drugs and alcohol. Their son, Eddie, died at 36 of a heroin overdose. Another son, Renaud, died suddenly at age 10 for reasons still mysterious to the family after selling water and begging for money at a cemetery near their home. My life has been buried, Rita told me before her death sitting on a torn brown vinyl couch in her living room, in a small sitting room, living room is generous, in Mauritius. What do I think about it, Rita said of her expulsion? It's as if I was pulled from my paradise to put me in hell. Experience of the Chagosians, I would suggest, are among the other costs of war, some of the other costs of war, of endless wars that the United States has been fighting, not just since 2001, but since independence. Again, I'd be happy to talk more about the Chagosian struggle to return home and their movement uh, to bring lawsuits against both the US and British governments or and the other details of that long struggle that I actually think is, is close to achieving uh, their ultimate aim of return. My research about the Chagossians, of course, showed me that the Chagossians are not alone, far from it. Uh, I've been able to document 24 cases in which local people have been displaced during the construction or expansion of US military bases abroad since 1898 alone. All but one of these people is an, either an indigenous people or another people of color, underlying, underlining the racism that, of course, shapes the Chagossians' experience and the experience of others displaced by US military bases abroad. Those displacements, of course, follow displacements and dispossession and genocidal death that Native American peoples experienced with the help of US military bases, US Army forts in North America across the 19th century and part of the 18th century before it. This is a map, the squares depict US Army forts, kind of military base, overlying the ancestral lands of the original indigenous inhabitants of what is now the United States, or this depicts part of the United States. My work with the Chagossians also opened my eyes to this huge collection of military bases the United States maintains around the world, and led me to ask questions like, why does the United States have a military base in the middle of the Indian Ocean? How is a base thousands upon thousands of miles from US borders protecting the United States? Does the United States need what are now 800 military bases overseas outside the 50 states in Washington, DC? It's about 800 foreign bases in around 83 foreign countries and colonies. 800 bases in 83 foreign bases and colonies. If, if, excuse me, 800 bases in 83 foreign countries and colonies. This interest in bases then led me to go do some research on many of these, or as many as I could visit without taking up the rest of my life, uh, bases around the world. Anyone know where this base is? Anyone want to guess? Maybe unmute yourself because I, for some reason, can't see the chat as uh... Guam. Good guess. It is an island. It looks. Would it be Puerto Rico? Also a good guess. Very close. Um, this is Guantanamo Bay. Most people think of the prison. They don't think of suburban housing developments like this one that I visited during my research at Guantanamo Bay. They don't think of, again, what is a small or not so small US American town plopped down in Puerto Rico, which is what the vast majority of the base looks like. The prison takes up a very small part of the base. And this is pretty representative of what US bases look like around the world. This interest in bases then, and the base comes complete with McDonald's and even somehow Scooby-Doo has ended up at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, Ronald McDonald by his side. 
This interest in bases has led me to explore the relationship between bases and war. Often US bases abroad are portrayed as being defensive in nature, there to help keep the peace, maintain regional stability. The evidence shows pretty much the exact opposite, that US bases abroad have been offensive in nature, have enabled US, a long series of US wars since 2001, and actually since independence, beginning with those US Army forts on Native American lands that helped not just enable war through US history, but have actually made war more likely in a range of ways. Okay, why don't I stop there? I think I've probably already gone longer than I wanted to before the first break, um, but I would love to take some questions, start our discussion, then I'll say a few more words, including some words about how I think we can put an end to these endless wars or be part of a movement that would. But yes, questions about any of what I've started with. Hey, Dr. Vine. I'm, I'm a student here at Fresno State. Uh, I was a soldier rounding up for about seven years. So I, I, I was very much with the picture. Um, and, you know, I really, last semester, I, I took your book to heart. I really, I really absolutely did. I, I think that uh, there, my, my perception of, of the whole military industrial complex has shifted significantly. Um, and I, I kind of, you know, my big takeaway is, is how, do, how do you keep a base safe? You build a base in front of that. And how do you keep that one safe? You build one in front of that. And, um, you know, we've gotten to the point when, when, when people first rolled in, uh, like 2002, uh, to those cities, they, they went in these soft top Humvees, right? You're, you're rolling through, you've got canvas, okay? And then they, they, they start having metal Humvees, but it's not like Black Hawk Down, where, where the bullets ricochet off it. They're very, they're very they're, but anyways, I, I just, I would like to point out to you, um, for, from being there, I mean, I haven't been deployed, but see, actually seeing things develop, now we have mine-resistant vehicles, Matt Max Pros and Matt Vs, and the emphasis, as far as I'm aware of, is, is no longer let's go get the, the, the head bad guy in charge. Let's just roll through the city in a mine resistant, RPG resistant, bullet resistant vehicle until they attack us. So I, I, would, I would say that the next step in building the bases is having miniature mobile bases that can act in an absolutely offensive capability. Um, I, I, that, that's really, I don't know, that, that's kind of my... my uh, the, the natural and it is so the, 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 the base isn't just uh, it isn't just one aspect of the war. The base is every aspect of the war because it's so much better to be on the defensive and, and be in your own turf or at least have that advantage than, than go out there and put yourself at risk. That, that's that's kind of uh, that's what I was vibing off of. I think you've described well what the endless wars have looked like in in large part or at least part of the endless wars. I'm going to point to some of the, the human effects and human damage of, of, of the wars, but I think you've, you've indeed described well what, what US war fighting has looked like in Iraq and Afghanistan. Let me see if now I can see the chat. So if anyone wants to put questions in the chat, feel free as well. Can I just ask a, a quick clarifying question, Professor Vine? Yeah. Um, how are you operationalizing the wars, the, the endless wars? I'm curious, like versus uh, low intensity conflicts versus all out war, if we're looking at like the correlates of war data set, how they're defining whether it's interstate, intrastate, extrastate, or non state war, um, just to maybe give me a, or give us all a better idea of specifically what, what are we talking about when we're saying war? Sure, sure. Um, let me share my screen again and share a different map from, from my book. Um, so this is a, a map that depicts US wars since independence. And the basis for this map is a Congressional Research Service report that the Congressional Research Service updates on a yearly basis with that lists uh, U.S. wars and other forms of combat since independence. So that's the the the, ba the ultimate basis for my list. Um, I've updated it in a few cases with what I see as as wars that uh, the 
or other combat that the Congressional Research Service overlooked. Probably the most controversial of those would be, I'm pretty sure that's not on the, uh, yeah, it's not on the CRS list, um, would be the Greek Civil War, where US officials, US military personnel were directing Greek forces during that civil war and providing weaponry. Um, and I think to not consider that a US war would be a mistake. Um, there, of course, you know, when we think of war, there are many other kinds of war. We can talk about wars fought within the United States uh, uh, and inflicted on, on for example, uh, Black communities in this country. Um, we can think about overseas, you know, coups, uh, other forms of paramilitary intervention. Those I have not included. Um, so I've been pretty strict in defining um, incidents that are clearly defined as war or that involve the deployment of U.S. military forces into combat. Thank you. This is a list, um, which is also in, in my book. Other clarifying questions or question? Um, I, I will just read one of the chat in case anyone didn't see it. Um, a helpful comment. Plus, these bases are physical presence and symbol of power, domination, control, a constant reminder that we are here. The argument I, I, I make in my book, Base Nation, is that US military bases abroad have been a major, have become a major form of US imperial power in the post-World War II period. I, as I've explained before, US bases abroad, again, beginning with those bases on Native American people's lands in North America, show that this is a long-standing, a much uh, longer pattern dating to independence. Um, but in the post-World War II era, US bases have been a major form of, of power and control that the US government has used to exert influence and control over other countries around the world. Uh, and you know that that expansion that, that you know that was the big thing. I, I think there's a war with Spain that made us an empire, and then uh, you know we were island hopping from place to place to place to uh, to, to expel the Japanese at that time, the, the Japanese Imperial Army. Um, you know, I, I'd like to point out an analogy to you, Doctor Doctor Vine. Um, you know, the, the way the way you call catch feel free to call me David. David. Sorry, to uh, the the way you catch a raccoon is you put like a penny in a trap. Like, and you don't even have to have like a mechanism and the raccoon will hold on to the penny. Okay. And in this case, I would define us as the raccoon or rather the U S military industrial complex, as the raccoon and the bases as the penny. Uh, I, I think the raccoon doesn't know what happens when it lets go maybe. And that, that might be why it doesn't let go. What, I mean, just, just the spitball. what do you think, what would happen if we pulled out? Well, so part of what I, I this is helpful, part of what I will um, argue or want to argue is that the United States can't just close all its bases and go home. This, my call is not one for isolationism. What I, I describe my proposal as one of drawing down and building up that as we close unnecessary and often really dangerous bases overseas, we have to build up U.S. diplomatic presence in tandem um, and engagement. And uh, yeah, this is not a sort of Trumpian um, screw the allies and run away or any call for isolationism, but instead is a, a call for a dramatically transformed uh, mode of engaging with the rest of the world based around diplomacy and cultural, economic, diplomatic forms of engagement. I can see how that shift would definitely help everyone out. Thank you. Um, let me just see if there's any, uh, maybe I'll just read the other in the chat. Yes, Professor Biden's recent orders of airstrikes in Syria against Iran-backed militias without congressional authorization, for which some of whom think articles of impeachment should be brought, stands as the most current example of the reliance on military responses over diplomatic ones. We need to develop a more diplomatic approach. And, I'm, and there are many reasons I'm actually quite hopeful about 
transformation under the Biden and Harris administration. And one is that they have talked about relying more on diplomacy. And I, I, I think we have to ensure that that, 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 we, that we keep them to their word. Um, and, and there are signs that there are members of Congress among many others uh, who also wanna see a dramatic transformation of, of US foreign policy. Uh, demilitarized foreign policy is, as Hank said, indeed. Uh, that 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 is certainly the the vision I wanna I wanna share with you. So maybe I'll I'll go back to uh, I'll go back to sharing a few more thoughts, including some proposals for uh, the kind of change I just alluded to, and and then open things again to to questions and and discussion. Did Deborah have a have a question? Oh, I'll wait till he's done. No, no, go ahead, Deborah. I I didn't see your hand raised or. Um, okay. um, my own incompetence. My uh, question from an old, old friend who's looked at a little bit about, um, and another colleague of ours, Devorn Sisavath, looks at the kind of legacies of military waste and garbage and toxics um, that get left behind when they do close down bases in the rare event. There's one in Alaska a formerly used defense site, they call it a FUD, if you're interested in the lingo. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess thinking about, I haven't read your, uh, this recent book yet, but I'm curious if um, you touch on the environmental consequences of bases, and then even if we did gradually shut down, what would it take to really, you know, uh, <laughs> eliminate the longer term consequences of the existence of these things on landscapes and in people's bodies. And not just in terms of like chemical toxicity, but also in terms of trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, since you opened with a uh, discussion of COVID and people's desire to go back to normal, but I think, you know, we're not going back to normal because people's bodies, whether they had COVID or not, are and minds are shaped by this. And we are shaped by the presence of bases at a spiritual level, but also at a biochemical level. So I'm wondering if you could just talk about that, if it ever comes up in any part of your book. Yeah, that's, I mean, really beautifully put. And Deborah's language actually echoes that of, of President Eisenhower when he was identifying the military industrial complex pointed to the, the spiritual effect of that complex. And the same is true of, of US military bases, both those abroad and, and those at home. And I would say, so it's really in my book, Base Nation, that I detail the many uh, forms of harm that, that US bases abroad in particular inflict around the world, uh, environmental effects among them. Uh, military bases sort of not surprisingly are not good for the environment. I mean, these are places that of course are, are, are designed to store large amounts of weaponry, toxic materials of many kinds, huge amounts of fuel. Um, so anywhere you find a military base, there are there is harm to the environment as well as to, to, to the human environment and, and including the spiritual level. Um, so, so it's there in, in Base Nation that I, I detail the environmental harm done by bases, as well as forms of social harm, economic harm, political harm, among others. And indeed, as, as Deborah's question suggests, to responsibly close US bases abroad would involve cleaning up the damage that we've done, which would take years, and, and, but, but is work that is desperately needed. Um, and the host countries will want this too, because Currently, U.S. bases are taking up large plots of land that could be used in much more productive ways for park space, uh, for schools, uh, for offices, for shopping. And there are plenty of examples of these sorts of conversion, the conversion of military bases into other uses. Um, but it does, of course, require uh, cleaning up the environmental damage. Okay, um, why don't I, yeah, again, share a few more words and then make sure, um, yeah, make sure just, maybe I'll just talk for about 10, 12 more minutes um, because I, I do wanna leave plenty of time for, for more questions and, and discussion. Um, I wanna, um, again, focus our attention on the human 
effects of these past 20 years of war. Uh, in this period, soon when we reach uh, October 7th of, of, of this year, we'll, we'll have a full 20 years of war. In that time, US combat troops have been fighting in at least 25 countries. I had to update this because of a report just yesterday that there are US special forces in Mozambique now. In that time, US military personnel have suffered around 15,000 deaths. And that includes uniformed military personnel and military contractors, 15,000 deaths, tens, hundred, hundreds of thousands of injuries as well, um, and trauma that will last generations. This number, of course, it pales in comparison to the total number dead in the war zones where US military personnel have been fighting in just the five most violent wars alone, around 4 million people have died. These are combatants, civilians on all sides, 4 million have died. Around 37 million people have been displaced in the eight most violent conflicts the, that the US military has been involved in since 2001. And that's a, a very conservative estimate that I made with the help of a great group of American University students for the Costs of War Project, which is the source of, of some of this data. Let me just quickly again share with you the experience of one of those 4 million dead. Uh, if you can't tell, and his family, if you can't tell, this is a, a body bag. Inside is, is one of the, the 4 million dead in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen alone. For privacy reasons, I'll call him R. On that Wednesday night in June, R's mother heard the knock at the door that she had dreaded for months. She opened the door and saw a stranger in front of her. For a nanosecond, she thought there might be good news about her son. Then, realizing why he was there, she started saying, no, 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 no. She told the man he had the wrong house and slammed the door shut. He knocked again. No, you have the wrong house. Ar's mother said. The man knocked again. When Ar's mother finally opened the door, the man put his foot inside the door to deliver the news that Ar was dead. Ar was just 29 years old when he died as a result of a bombing. He grew up in a town of less than 6,000. He loved sports and music. He married young. When he died, he left behind a widow and a six-year-old child. Ar's mother described how Ar was tall and could look intimidating at first but had a boyish smile and soft eyes. That smile, Ar's mother said, I miss that smile. As photographs and medical notes after the bombing show, Ar died of severe injuries to his skull and brain. The bomb blast hit Ar's face and fractured his jaw and nasal bones in multiple places. The explosion fractured Ar's skull and caused bruising and bleeding inside and around the brain. The bomb broke both forearm bones, fractured Ars left clavicle, and caused bruising and bleeding around both lungs. I'm sorry for sharing such graphic detail and for not warning people actually in advance of doing so. Uh, but I think, again, it's important to look directly or as directly as possible at the human effects of these endless wars. I think with that in mind, we have to again return to the $6.4 trillion that US taxpayers have obligated, have spent, or will spend. $6.4 trillion is its hard to wrap your brain around $1 trillion, let alone $6.4 trillion. But I think if we think deeply about that figure, it's a figure that should make us weep. How many have died, in addition to those that have died in the wars, how many have died because of investments the US government has not made while they've been investing $6.4 trillion in war? 
it's the number of four-year college scholarships that we could have paid for with $6.4 trillion, 181 million four-year college scholarships. It's the number of clean energy jobs we could have paid for with $6.4 trillion, 86.5 million clean energy jobs. This is the number of people who could have received high quality healthcare for 19 years with the $6.4 trillion spent. 32.5 million people could have re received high quality healthcare for 19 years. And again, I think we have to think about how many COVID deaths could have been prevented if the US government had invested in adequate pandemic preparedness and a system of universal healthcare for all among other uh, public health investments? I think the answer in my mind is clearly hundreds of thousands of COVID deaths. Again, I wanna just briefly mention that this period of endless war since 9-11 is not an exception in US history. It's part of a much larger pattern of war. I showed you the map and list of countries that the United States has fought wars with or engaged in combat with. US military has been involved in a war, or some other form of combat in 234 out of 245 years in US history, in more than 135 foreign lands. Again, the map I shared before, the list that you find in actually the inside of my, it's one of the fun things I got to do with the, this book, The United States of War. Um, it's on the end papers of the book. My fear is that these endless wars will continue unless we decide to make some dramatic changes and pressure the US government to make dramatic changes. These wars have been referred to as the endless wars for a long time. US military personnel, analysts, think tank types have long referred to this series of wars as the long war or increasingly as infinite war. Forever war is another way that US military personnel, US military officers in particular, the highest ranking military personnel and other uh, supposed national security intellectuals, national security leaders have, have used to describe these wars. An NBC News reporter asked uh, one of the highest ranking generals in the US Army, Admiral, uh, excuse me, General Joseph Hotel, do you think it's a forever war? I don't know if it's, if it's you know, Forever war, Votel replied, divine forever, which would be funny if it weren't for the catastrophic consequences of these wars. So let me just quickly share a few proposals for transformation. I think we do have a choice. We have to pay attention to the power structures that shape this, the choice. Uh, but I think we need to demand and ensure a transformation of our foreign policy, which would mean also a transformation of our domestic policy. And I think the choices around investment and the COVID pandemic show how dramatically um, out of alignment our foreign policy and domestic policy choices have been. So real quickly, 10 big picture proposals. First and foremost, the, the aim, the goal of US foreign policy must be peace and the avoidance of war, violence reduction. War cannot be a legitimate policy option. And the fact that it remains in the minds of some US leaders and some think tank types in DC is part of the problem we have to confront. We have to end the endless wars for reasons that I think I've uh, outlined. We have to remind people and act on this knowledge that war is not an effective response to terrorism. We have to prevent a war with China at all costs. And just in this past week, the Secretary of State has been making utterances that are only making such a war more likely. Again, the fact that US leaders, some, and other people in what 
is often referred to as the blob, the very small group of mostly white men, wealthy white men in Washington, D.C. and in around Washington, D.C. who control U.S. foreign policy. The fact that they are contemplating a war with China should frighten us. The fact that they can contemplate a war between the two wealthiest and the two wealthiest countries in the world and two nuclear armed powers. Such a war would likely make the horrific catastrophe of the last 19 going on 20 years of war look small in, com in contrast or certainly could. It's hard to even get the words out to imagine such a war. We have to build peace, not just with China, but with Russia, Iran, and North Korea. That must be the focus of engagement with those countries. We have to prioritize the abolition of nuclear weapons. There is an existential threat facing us in global warming and climate change, but there is another existential threat to all of humanity that doesn't get enough attention. And that is the threat that the existence of nuclear weapons and even an accidental detonation or an accidental or accidentally triggered war uh, presents for all of humanity. We have to defund the warfare state, the economic base beneath this system of endless war has to be undermined. And that be begins with cutting the US military budget in half in the next five years. That's my proposal. I'm happy to say there are a growing number of people in Congress who are demanding a 10% cut in the US military budget in this coming fiscal year. The Biden administration has made signs that they just want to freeze the military budget, which is a small improvement over, over Trump, but we need to push for cuts. The US military budget is at least the size of the next 10 largest military budgets in the world combined. If the US cut its military budget in half, it would still have the largest military budget on earth. And most of the other countries in the top 10 military budgets in the world are allies of the United States. Their US military budget is totally out of proportion to the threats, the military threats facing the United States. Um, we have to demand a peace dividend as we end the endless wars. We have to reduce the power of the military industrial complex, uh, which of course wants to hang on to the money that has been plowed into the warfare state since World War II in particular. I have some more specific proposals for how to do that, um, including some, uh, some structural changes in, 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 in constitutional changes, in, in, in including. Um, nine, we have to focus on cross-issue organizing. We have to remind people, people who are working on environmental issues, people who are working on affordable housing, people working on improving our public schools, people who are working on improving the infrastructure from the electric infrastructure that we saw crumble in Texas or the public water systems like the one in Jackson, Mississippi, which has left people without clean drinking water for more than five weeks. We need to remind people who are working in these areas that the money is there, the money exists, the money has been plowed into this system of endless war, and we need to move the money. We also have to democratize foreign policy making. So it's not mostly white dudes like me, wealth, relatively wealthy white dudes like me, making the decisions. And 10, we need to de-imperialize the United States. We need to recognize that the United States is an empire, has been an empire since independence, was not, not just an empire beginning in 1898, but was an empire beginning at independence. And as one saw the United States expand as an empire across North, North America, uh, it's hard to imagine what word one could use to describe that expansion and the death and destruction and dispossession and di displacement of Native American peoples. Hard to imagine what we, how we, else we could describe that uh, other than with the word empire. And just some specifics on de-imperializing the United States, the drawdown build up, closing bases abroad, building up diplomatic presence and diplomatic engagement, decolonizing the US colonies, a process that must be led by people in those colonies, often referred to as territories, but they're in a colonial relationship with the United States government. We have to decolonize the 50 states, fulfilling indigenous land uh, and treaty rights. 
And we have to make a serious effort at, at reckoning with this long history of war, especially or beginning with the past 20 years of war. And in my mind, that includes reparations for the people and countries that we have wrecked so much havoc in and where we have contributed to the loss of so many millions of lives. Also processes of reconciliation with countries where the US military has been fighting wars. I'm gonna stop there. There's of course, look, I'm gonna stop there because I wanna hear from you. And I've gone longer than I wanted. Hank, I, I think you're muted. Yes, thank you. So with a, with a large um, goal like de-imperializing the US, you know, I, we, of course, I'm sure you realize like we have to somehow like think about how do we break that down into smaller things that need to happen first, right? And I know that there's some of these things that you've called for could be the subject of like a mass political movement that just uses the levers of, you know, social movements and political pressure and so on. But there's also the level of like, to de-imperialize the US, we have to first, like you said, understand that we are an empire. Or to build peace with, with North Korea and Iran, we have to realize that, you know, we are not the beacon of freedom and democracy around the world, that what we are doing in the world is very different. And those, those realizations are such deep parts of the, the, the mainstream US self view. It's daunting, you know? I mean, I'd, I'd like to know what you, what do you think about the balance between like just political pressure politics versus like the ideological struggle of trying to chip away at the ideological supports for these things that are so bad for us? Like where, where do we start, <laughs> you know? This is not an easy effort. I, I think a beginning place for me though is to recognize that empires come to an end eventually and the US empire will come to an end. And people in the United States have a choice about how that empire comes to an end. And we can roll up, roll down our empire. We can, uh, or we can have our empire in a, in a controlled and, and organized fashion, or we can have our empire crumble amid war or economic disaster, seems to me. I think also we need to think as broadly as possible. Um, we can't constrain our thoughts about what we want to demand and what we want to see. Um, if we do, I think you know that becomes sort of the worst kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I think the two dimensions you pointed to, I think we need to work on simultaneously the ideological dimension, the modes of thinking of consciousness. Um, and I would point in particular, especially for students um, to this group dissenters, it's a relatively new group that is focusing its work and it, it's a student run, um, student of color run, youth of color run organization that is focusing on changing the culture around, which is a word I use advisedly, um, but changing the culture and, and, and ideas about war and the military um, and, and has been doing some really exciting work, I would say. Um, I can come back to that and we'll share these slides for anyone who would like any of the resources involved. Um, but I, I think we have to press on the economic and political foundations. I, I think that, you know, it, to me is, is critical that consciousness in my mind will probably follow um, cutting the military budget dramatically, closing bases abroad. Um, and let me just point to, I mean, I think there, again, there are many encouraging signs in my mind of, of progress and, and, and that this kind of change is underway. I don't know if folks saw this, um, USA Today, I think it was about two or three weeks ago, um, a reckoning is near, front page, major article. The subtitle was a little bit different online. The subtitle online was, America has a vast 
overseas military empire, does it still need it? If USA Today is questioning US empire, this is a good sign. This is a good sign. And, and when, you know, just look at the issue of US military bases abroad. This is not just a, a lefty fantasy of, you know, to close bases abroad. There are people across the political spectrum for a whole range of reasons who agree that the United States military has far too many bases abroad and needs to begin closing them uh, urgently. You know, some are more focused on the economic dimensions, the economic costs of these bases. They cost about $51.5 billion a year just to maintain US bases abroad, 51.5 billion just for the bases to maintain them, to run them. There are others who, like Deborah, are more focused on the, the effects on, on local peoples and local environments. Um, but I think we have to work in, in both these or multiple directions simultaneously. Thank you. David, would you mind speaking to the issue of the glorification of the military and the academy? This, it, it troubles me to have our ROTC on campus. And I don't know any of the details. It's not my area of expertise. I just know that my building is right next to them. And so I walk through them when they're working out in the morning. And the glorification of the military at our graduation ceremonies. These are the, these things trouble me. And, and I, I, do you have thoughts about these things? I do. And they trouble me as well. And I'm so glad you're troubled. I think we need to speak out, especially anyone who's tenured, anyone who has some, some, some protection and power needs to speak out. So for the last many years, I, I finally did get a change. At our graduation, they, the you know, powers that be at the university asked the veterans in the audience to stand and people who are going into the military to stand up and be applauded by everyone. Now, I think those people deserve some, applause. I think we should be really careful in thinking about what they deserve applause for. But if we're going to applaud them, we should be applauding teachers, people who are going into teaching or the health professions. Um, so basically, I kept harassing my dean and, and the provost about this. And, and they did make a change by adding uh, recognition for teachers and health, people in health professions and, and the like. Um, another example, my school, uh, school of at least uh, one person in, in the room, um, recently put on its board the former CEO of Northrop Grumman, one of the large world's largest producers of weapons of mass destruction, and one of the largest weapons manufacturers in the world, responsible for many thousands of deaths in, in the post 9-11 wars alone. Um, you know, so I've been um, basically trying to help support a student-led campaign, dissenters-led campaign um, to get him off the board. Uh, ROTC is, is difficult and, you know, again, points to the economic foundations of this system of endless war that for so many people in this country, the military is one of very few options available to them to have, to make a living, to have a career. Uh, we need to change that. We need dramatically to change that. And, and if there's any doubt, I hope people understand that the critique I'm offering is a critique of a system, a critique of a system of endless war, a critique of the military industrial complex, a critique of an empire, not of the people in that system. Um, I think we're all in the system, um, but people in the military, the vast majority of them are not the ones who deserve critique or criticism. There are some people at the very top we should be very critical of. I hope that was a big, but in short, we need to speak up and speak out. Yeah. Well, thank you, David. And Hank and Deborah, if, if you know of opportunities on our campus to be part of a, a voice, um, just put me on your list. This is something I, uh, I, I don't really know how to do it by myself. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And just David, David's <laughs> last comments just now, especially about the graduation ceremony recognition hits home. So yeah, I think you'll hear something from me about this. Katie, I'll remember you for that. Yeah. So I have, a, I have a question if I'm not jumping in front of anybody else. Um, just looking back at your first, your, your very first goal, which is uh, a good goal, peace, right? Um, but you have peace, avoiding war and violence reduction. So I'm just curious, how, how do you deal or how do you address 
governments that are attacking their populations or violating their populations rights around the world and just the US not being in, if, if it were to happen, the US not being involved in war does not necessarily mean violence reduction around the world by any means. Now, maybe in the long run, if you change norms, somehow that might happen, but certainly not in the short run. So how do you get there? Well, I, I don't know about that initial conclusion. Okay. I mean, if we just look at the last 20 years of war, someone in the in the chat, you know, mentioned Dr. King's words describing the United States as the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. I think that was true in 1968 when he said those words. And I think that's true today, or certainly has been in the past 20 years. So if we stop, if we brought an end to the endless wars and stopped getting in new wars, I think that would go a long way to making the world more peaceful. Would that bring, you know, peace on earth, Shangri-La? No, of course. Um, but the way to the, the way to react to human rights violations, governments committing acts of violence against their their people, is not to, for the U.S. military to go invade more countries. Um, the reaction has to be an international and global one, um, based around diplomacy. I mean, I think again and again in these past twenty years of war, we've seen the unintended and unanticipated but anticipatable consequences of using military force to react to violence. Libya is a perfect example. You know, the Obama administration participated in, in a, a war in Libya that brought an end to the Gaddafi regime, but has left that country shattered. And in a, a you wanted to respond. Oh no, I wasn't. I wasn't necessarily suggesting that the 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 better response was military in, intervention. Okay. But, and of course, a diplomatic response is best. But how do you get that diplomatic response that works that prevents the the violence? I mean, I guess it's a million dollar question, maybe. But I mean, it, of course, the diplomatic response would be best, and military intervention often does make things worse. Uh, but how do you how do you get that best option? And, well, you know, it, how, yeah, yeah. And how do you convince the Taliban, Al Qaeda, the you know Bashar al-Assad, and all those people to just you know stop attacking their their populations or to make peace with you? And what do you give up for that? I think looking at at you know some of the root causes of 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 violence of militant movements is is critical and beginning to address them rather than just responding with military force that tends to, and research shows, has just created more who would seek to use violence to achieve their political ends. Um, you know, I, I think the UN is profoundly flawed, but it is an entity that the United States could invest in more deeply, um, along with others around the world, uh, to, to be a tool for peace. And it has been in, in some cases. Um, so I think uh, it's of the flawed options available to us. Um, it's certainly among the best, I would suggest. Thanks. You know, democratizing the UN is another has to be another part of that picture um, because it's far from a democratic institution. Yeah, that that has issues too, because what it, then? How do you get? How, how do you get those other countries involved that you want to change if they're not part of the discussion? But, but I, yeah. Well, that's, well, I, I'm sure other people have- <laughs> Sorry, I let, let no, it- No, it's a great off. question. I'm sure other people in the room have, have thoughts about, about that. And I've probably thought about it more than, more than I, so. If, if I might, you know, it's a great question, Melanie, and, uh, David, you mentioned Libya, and I have to say for me personally, the US intervention in Libya was kind of a turning point. It was kind of like the end of a long journey for me because when it first started to happen, I, I, my initial thought was how exciting, you know, the people of Libya are getting this chance to, uh, you know, throw off this dictator and why shouldn't we help them? And, and a dear friend, you know, corrected me and just pointed out that when we go in and do these things, even when we say they're for these great reasons, the, the result is destruction. It is, it is, it was 
horrible for Libya what happened, and this is not a defense of Muammar Gaddafi, but it's just an object. The objective fact is that we helped to destroy Libya in many ways, uh, just like we did Iraq, and, and we could go on. And so um, I, I've, I've, and like I said, that kind of crystallized where I was already headed, which is um, if it's a militarized foreign policy, then it's best. Uh, really just to not intervene militarily because it tends to make things worse. And so then the question rightly, Melanie, is, well, then what? And there's so many other things at our disposal. I mean, I always go back to Iraq. I mean, Iraq was contained on the eve of the of the Iraq war. Iraq was effectively contained. Yes, there was a military component, but there were also other components. There was not an active, you know, shooting war going on in Iraq, but Hussein was contained. We didn't need to go to war there. So there are a lot of other ways to 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 get to that um, that same end, that yeah, that don't end in the wholesale destruction of infrastructure, civil society, um, hundreds of thousands of deaths, and 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 all the other things that come from our sometimes sometimes well-intentioned interventions, and the production of new groups, entities like ISIS that have brought untold destruction in addition to that already produced, which is to say that the war, US war in Iraq gave birth to ISIS, a group that did not exist um, and that now is threatening, well, it's unclear what links there are, but you know, places and people as far away as Mozambique. I mean, it's, it's sad to think, you know, that it, it, it pains me to think that it might mean sitting back and saying, there's something really bad happening somewhere in the world right now but we, our, our options for making it better are very limited and military action is one of them. And, and I, I think about that, you know, I, I think about my own position and what I, would I be willing to watch, you know, Saddam Hussein or uh, Bashar Assad or Muammar Gaddafi or whoever do what they do. And, and I've concluded, unfortunately, that I, I am. If the only thing that we can imagine about ourselves is military intervention, then yes, I am willing to sit and watch but we don't have to sit and watch because there are other things we can do aside from militarized foreign policy i hope that makes sense um let's take is there anybody else uh, uh, maybe one more comment or question here we're, we're drawing close to our time yeah, you know, I've, I've tried to get the, the word out, David. I've, I've, I've talked to my friends. To, the wait, 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 Paul, Paul, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I would love, but maybe we could just wait and see if there's someone who hasn't had a chance to speak yet, uh, who sometimes, you know, it's a little harder for people to jump in. And I'd be happy to take your question after we formally end. Okay, well, it sounds like you're a pop. Okay, I, I've, I've talked to my friends to varying degrees about this, what I learned from your book. And uh, typically, they just give me the blankest of stares. They just, they're absolute, they have, they have nothing to say. It's not like even an affirmation. It's, it's, it's absolute indifference. And I think this kind of touches on before how you said that this really isn't a, it isn't a partisan issue. I, I, and that's probably why I'm here in this room is it, it, there's, it's, it's completely bipartisan. And, you know, I, I, I had a chance to speak about this on a platform and I was told that this is not mainstream enough that I told specifically that, that this, this topic isn't mainstream enough. And I'm like, well, it's war. How, how is war not mainstream? Um, and I, I, I don't know how, how, how do we break this down to be digestible for everyone without oversimplifying it. I guess that that's a really big challenge for me instead of just hitting this, this, this trope of, okay, war is bad. Let me give you 6.4 trillion ways to break it down. Okay. And 6.4 trillion reasons why everyone should care. As you can see, you know, it's now 5.3 in terms of money that's already been spent. But again, the 6.4 plus includes interest payments in the future and veterans payments in the future. I think this is the place to start. People don't realize that their money has been stolen. I think we need to go back to the language of Eisenhower who described military spending as a theft. And that's what it is. It's a theft from all of us, as he said. 
and we need to show this theft and show that our money could be used differently. And I think this is the place to start. Well, with that, um, I'm sad to say that our time with uh, Dr. Vine is at an end. So um, thank you once again, David, for your, for your comments and for your, uh, for your commitments. And thank you to uh, all the faculty. There are faculty here from Fresno City College and Fresno State and students as well. A few folks I don't know, sorry if I missed you. It was really good to see you all here. Um, thank you very much, David. If you can virtually clap, feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Um, it's really great to meet you. And just sorry not to be able to do it in person. But I thank you for all the great provoking, thought provoking, important questions. Super. Well, um, it's a, uh, obviously it's a heavy topic, but I hope that we can all think about things that we can do and consider, um, you know, some of David's um, pointers about things that we can do and where we can take it from here. I'm certainly thinking about those things myself. So have a good day. Thanks.